share a bunch of nonsense about Bitcoin mining, we invited the experts here to set the record straight. Please welcome Bob McElrath, a Bitcoin hacker and PhD in theoretical physics, Rachel Rabarchek, the Vice President of Mining at Dal Galaxy Digital, and Matt Corallo from Spiral. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so we, we were gonna go through a little bit, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot going on in the mining space right now. Um, a lot of new work coming out that's come out recently and, and hopefully gonna change the structure of things a little bit. Um, so we, we figured we were gonna start a little bit with a quick history of kind of how mining works today, some developments, major developments that happened in the mining, especially kind of in the pooling space over the last however many years. Uh, and then chat a little bit about where things are going, where things are hopefully going, um, and work that, that these wonderful people are doing. Um, so, yeah, so kind of the history or at least current designs of mining and the kind of uh, how pools work today was a little bit of an accident, right? So we had a bunch of people solo mining, um, everyone just mine directly on Bitcoin Core, then eventually mine via uh, the RPC interface on Bitcoin Core um, with their GPUs and everyone was just solo mining and then all of a sudden it got really difficult uh, and there wasn't any software built, no one had really uh, considered how to build a pool, any of this kind of stuff uh, until the slush, uh, slush pool folks uh, who have now rebranded brains um, built one. So they built the first one, they kind of did it in-house, they built it uh, built it the way they wanted to build it, um, and it wasn't, you know, certainly wasn't some kind of large open standard that came from a number of people. Uh, it turns out they, the Electrum protocol and the Stratum protocol were kind of the same protocol originally. Um, it was kind of this sprawling thing that, that supported SPV mining and SPV clients and then also payout reward distribution uh, and just kind of did all the things. Um, but of course, it also made the simplifying assumption that the pool would select the work that miners work on, right? That's the easiest way to implement a pool. You just say, uh, instead of the local user doing that work with Bitcoin Core, you remove Bitcoin Core entirely, and you have the pool select all the transactions, have the pool select all the data. Um, and of course, this also made sense because the protocol was also built to be Electrum, to be kind of an SPV client server. Uh, so, of course, you wanted SPV mining too, right? Why Why wouldn't you? Um, so this this turned out to be somewhat unfortunate over the last many years in development of, of Bitcoin. We had, what, three times in Bitcoin's history where was there a pool that had more than 50% of hash power? Um, it was Ghash and crap, I'm not going to yeah. remember. I'm not going to remember the other ones. Probably come to trivia. I'm sure that will be a trivia question, so I just gave you one of the answers. So if you come to Socratic trivia later... Um, you'll at least be up one. Um, but so as a consequence, you know, uh, obviously decentralization matters in Bitcoin. Um, and so there was this, this great idea at some point in, I don't know, 2011 maybe, uh, to build a peer-to-peer -peer pool. Uh, and so I think Bob wanted to chat a little bit about what that was, yeah. how it worked, and, and why it isn't with us today. Yeah, so P2 pool was a was a good idea in 2011. Um, uh, anonymous guy, V Forest, wrote it. Okay, um, <laughs> uh, wrote P2 pool. No, what P2 pool is? It's a blockchain for the purpose of creating Bitcoin blocks. Um, and it had what it had was a, a block time that was uh, uh, 30 seconds, right? So it's 20 times faster than than Bitcoin. Um, so it could generate 20 times more shares or blocks in its blockchain than than Bitcoin had. And so could keep track of 20 times more uh, miners, essentially. Um, so this worked great it, uh, for many years. Um, the problem with it was that as you decrease the block time, uh, you become much more latency sensitive. Now I only have 30 seconds to propagate my block to all the other miners who are mining so that they can build on it. Um, and the, the mean time of propagating blocks around the network is around six seconds today with the, the gossip network that Bitcoin has. So what happened was that... Um, uh, on P2 pool, you could gain a lot by screwing with your latency and, and optimizing your peers. Um, and there was a big disparity between uh, people who did that and people who didn't. 
Um, and it, it ended up being a very unfair pool because of that. Um, and there were some strange things in it too because it kept track of orphans, uh, but it called them dead on arrival shares. Um, and so there was, uh, you'd look at your dashboard and it would show you a whole bunch of dead on arrival shares. So it was a bit of a kind of a messaging problem there that it looked like the pool wasn't working very well. But as far as decentralization goes, it was kind of the perfect answer. Um, and it, it died, I don't know, around 2015 or so. Um, and Matt pointed out the reason for this was kind of interesting. Apparently, um, when Bitmain released the S7, the, the way P2 pool works is it basically paid everybody in the Coinbase. So the Coinbase transaction would have hundreds or thousands of outputs corresponding to everybody in the pool. Um, and this made a kind of a nasty competition because you're using up block space that you could have taken transactions and get, gotten paid fees instead of uh, losing that space to paying everybody. Uh, but this meant that the Coinbase transaction was really huge. And the way Bitcoin mining works, there are two or three places that the mining device uh, increments and nonce. There's a nonce in the block header itself. Um, there's an extra nonce, which is a, a field in the Coinbase transaction. And then there's the, the, the timestamp or version, which some, some mining equipment rolls as well. Um, but the way, when you send a, a block header to a mining device, you send it the Coinbase transaction as well um, in like two pieces. There's a the beginning and then there's the tail and in the middle is a, a number that it can increment. Um, the S7 produced by Bitmain had a limitation on how big that could be. And the P2 pool Coinbases were too large. Um, so basically you couldn't mine on P2 pool with an S7. And that is basically when P2 pool died because uh, Bitmain was the dominant producer of, of mining equipment at that time. Now we have other people, but uh, this this is why it died. Yeah, and I think once it died, it, it never, sadly, was never revived. There are actually, I, I believe Monero is like mostly P2 pool or something. Monero, so it's Monero actually has like its own really P2 good, pool now. Yeah. yeah, so it's actually like much better mining decentralization. Um, now they only have fewer miners and probably some botnets, but neither here nor there. Um, so yeah, there, there was this great P2 pool project. Uh, it suffered from UX issues and, and was floundering a little bit and then eventually got completely killed by Bitmain's technical decisions. Um, and so we were left with only centralized pools. So for, for the last, I mean, what you said, it died in 20... I'm guessing 2015. 2015 or something oh. like that. Um, so in the last, what, seven years, we've we've only had these centralized pools that that do the transaction selection and all the work in-house. Um, and there's been uh, the idea of building a centralized pool that doesn't do the transaction selection is actually very old. It uh, goes back to at least, two, I don't know, seven, eight years. Um, but actual implementations of it have never existed uh, until now. So I don't know if Rachel wants to go into a little bit of detail on, on Stratum v2 and, and the work you guys have been doing there? Yeah, so Stratum v2 is the next generation mining protocol from Stratum v1. Um, like Matt said, uh, there's been a lot of like centralized transaction selection by the pools. Um, and Stratum v2, one of its like really unique features is the fact that it allows the miner the option to select their own transaction set. So it's like further democratizing the block template, which is something that's um, really important just when we face like different sort of like regula regulatory issues. Um, and in addition to the uh, transaction selection, which I think most people in, uh, you know, at this conference today would consider to be the most important feature of Stratum V2, there's a lot of other important features that, uh, you know, actual miners really will care about. And for one, it's the, uh, the protocol itself is a binary protocol. Um, Stratum V1 had, uh, was using JSON RPC, which is a very verbose protocol. It's uh, all sent in plain text. Um, it leaves it open to a variety of different man in the middle attacks um, that Stratum V2 completely negates. So the, like, that's main, the main feature that miners really want to pay attention to. So there's encrypted communications in Stratum V2, right? Yeah, there's an encryption channel between the pool and the miner. Okay. That Stratum V1 doesn't have. Oh, I know, Matt, you've you've complained several times about BGP attacks on Stratum V1. You want to <laughs> talk about what that is? Uh, yeah, so just ISP level, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of network level attacks against Stratum V1, right? So Stratum V1 is just this, like Rachel mentioned, plain text protocol. You ask the pool server, you say, hey, I want some work to work on. Here's my, my username, pay out there. Um, and the pool gives you some work, and hopefully you pay out there. Uh, to the address that, that you specify, or username, or what have you. Um, but 
okay, it's completely plain text protocol. What happens if your ISP is malicious or decides like they want they want a little bit of that hash rate, hash rate that you're so generously sending in plain text and unauthenticated over their uh, their network? Um, turns out there's not really anything you can do about this. Um, and and you know, obviously, if they took all of your hash rate, you would pretty quickly see that you're not getting payouts anymore, and and someone's doing something. But if they took say 0.1 percent of your hash rate you probably would not notice and you probably, I mean, it might show up in your luck, but your your luck statistic is not going to materially show that kind of a change for a very long amount of time, or at least, you know, unless you have a very, very large amount of hash rate. Um, so historically, some miners have been worried about this. Uh, there are, I think there was at least one case where it did happen. It wasn't, I don't think it was the ISP. I think it was a, a malicious actor within the farm who installed some kind of proxy at the network level in the farm. Um, but it seems very possible that some ISPs, especially outside of the Western world, uh, you know, there's a lot of mining in, in Siberia and other parts of the world. Uh, and Kazakhstan, I think, has been popular recently, too. Um, who, you know, how much do you really trust your ISP? Um, and, and are they going to steal some of your hash rate? Yeah, so what happened there is um, because the protocol is completely unauthenticated, you send a request to the uh, the pool saying, give me a, a block header to work on. Um, the IP address that you're talking to um, can be hijacked via the BGP protocol. BGP is the border gateway protocol. It's about how different subnets find each other and how you route around the internet. Um, and because it's completely authenticated, unauthenticated, if another server comes in and man in the middle is that, um, they replace the block header that you thought you are supposed to be working on with one that has their payout address. So this is how they steal hash rate. This has been done a few times uh, in, in reality. Yeah, and, and we've seen BGP level attacks on, I think AWS has been hijacked four times to steal cryptocurrency over the last number of years um, for, for various different attacks. Uh, luckily, I don't think any of them uh, Bitcoin related, but, but to steal various cryptocurrency projects. Um, so Stratum V2 completely fixes this, and we all need to start using it. <laughs> right. And it may also be worth noting that, that Stratum V2 also finally fixes the issue that you don't have to send the Coinbase transaction to the mining device anymore. Uh, so that, that issue that Bob mentioned that kind of killed P2Pool because the mining devices couldn't handle a large Coinbase transaction. Uh, the, the whole concept that a, a mining device sees this Bitcoin level protocol information about you know Coinbase transactions and a Merkle tree and all kinds of stuff like that uh, is just kind of bad to begin with. Um, and now that we can roll the version uh, and the time, uh, we don't necessarily need that anymore. Uh, so hopefully that, that also gets adopted as a part of Stratum V2. I didn't realize that. How does that work? So you're just dumping extra nonce and using version and time instead? Yeah, there, there's enough. If you use 16 bits of the version and the, the nonce itself, the original nonce that's in the header is, is, is four bytes. Um, that is sufficient for, I don't know how many how much hash rate, but 100 tera hashes or something. Um, as long as you can roll the version once per second, or the, the time once per second. So you just okay. increment the time once per second, and then you, you have whatever, 32 plus 16 bits of, of nonce directly in the header to roll. You never have to look at anything beyond the header. Interesting, cool. So what else do we want to talk about? Um, <laughs> I wanted to hear about the relay networks and, and their demise, oh. personally. Yeah, um, right. So, so Stratum V2, all of these decentralized mining things makes Relay more interesting, right? So like Bob mentioned, uh, especially for P2Pool, um, P2Pool had a very fast block time uh, because it was this merge mine chain, and uh, that caused some issues. You know, users could, if they had better peers, their block propagation could be optimized a little more, and they could get a little more revenue. Uh, plus, the UX, in fact, displayed how good your propagation was compared to everyone else on the network, uh, which frustrated users a lot. Um, so, there are similar issues in Bitcoin, right? You know, we have to get miners care about getting blocks as fast as they can to other miners, so the other miners start building on their blocks, and maybe their block won't be orphaned. Um, Orphans are relatively low in Bitcoin. Obviously, we have a 10-minute block time, uh, and so that, or I think the average is nine point something, actually, when you run the math, but Peter would have to correct me on that. Um, the, when you actually run the, when you're, when you're a miner, so you have plenty of time to get your block out, but, you know, anything helps. Uh, so a little, a little 
a little more block propagation helps. And so I spent a lot of time working on uh, very, very fast block propagation. So instead of relying on the Bitcoin core peer-to-peer -peer network, which is, you know, uh, a really robust protocol designed to make sure everyone gets blocks. It's not designed to make sure everyone gets blocks almost immediately. Um, uh, working on redoing that to, to use what's called forward error correction. So basically just uh, sending more data to peers so that if some packets get lost uh, along the route, you can still get the data. Um, building out networks to do this really fast. Uh, it, you know, they worked very well. You know, we were able to get block propagation down to a few milliseconds in excess of the speed of light and how long light just takes to get from one place to another in the world. Um, but at the end of the day, there's only so many pools out there. Uh, they, they all peer with each other. Uh, they all operate on in data centers, in AWS, on, on virtual hosts, on whatever. Um, and so the advantages for them are, are relatively less. But when we start talking again about things like P2Pool, when we start talking about users creating Bitcoin blocks, uh, when we start talking about yeah, users creating Bitcoin blocks even on centralized pools with Stratum V2, uh, suddenly those, those users who are operating at a farm on some residential AT&T DSL line or what have you out in the middle of nowhere, um, they're now responsible for relaying those blocks. So they're now responsible for making sure they get blocks quickly from the Bitcoin network and that they relay the blocks they might have found out to the Bitcoin network very quickly. Um, so suddenly these projects are going to uh, have much more importance going forward. Um, and so uh, someone needs to revive them. And I'm not signing myself up to do it quite yet. All right, what else can we talk about? Um, what, what else is in Stratum V2? What else are you guys doing? Well, yeah, I'd like to talk about kind of where the project is at currently. Um, so there is a open source Stratum V2 uh, effort. It's called the Stratum Reference Implementation, or SRI. And uh, it's being developed right now to be the uh, main reference implementation. So everyone who is implementing any facet of the Stratum V2 protocol, whether that is uh, a firmware developer or a pool developer or a miner who wants to create a proxy. Um, in order for them to claim that they are implementing like the full Stratum V2 uh, protocol or compatible, they have to be compatible with this uh, SRI repo. So that's the, the main goal right now is just to have like a, a source of truth for everyone implementing it. Um, with Stratum V1, uh, the protocol is never really fully specified. There's a lot of different implementations, a lot of custom proxies that miners have to build. And so it's really important with the Stratum V2 effort that we all maintain compatibility. Um, the last thing we want is to have like some sort of uh, fork in the protocol I, that would not benefit anyone. Um, specifically in this sort of like nascent time when we're when we're really at the beginning of the adoption phase. Um, one of the biggest concerns is if a manufacturer implements Stratum V2 in their firmware and it's uh, slightly deviated from the SRI implementation because if this happens and a manufacturer releases a deviated version, uh, it's likely that that version will become the default. And we just really want to avoid that for the most part. Yeah, we've had plenty of compatibility issues across miners with Stratum V1. <laughs> we don't want that again. Um, so we, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, kind of Stratum V2 lets miners select block templates. Uh, do you want to go into a little bit of detail on the structure of, you know, Stratum V2 is actually like four or five different protocols and like kind of the structure of the layout of, you know, how, how does a network, how does a, a miner, where does the pool sit, like what are the different protocols in play, um, and, and how does that, that end up actually looking for the, the miner, the farm, what software runs where, that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, so there's a lot of moving parts with Stratum V2. Uh, it's very modular. It's a much more complete protocol than Stratum V1, um, but with that modularity comes more complexity. So the protocol is broken down into uh, four or five sub protocols. Um, there's the main mining protocol that uh, you know a mining firmware, a mining proxy will uh, use to communicate to the pool. Um, but there's a few other sub-protocols that, uh, for instance, allow for uh, the miner to select their own transactions or the pool to select the transactions. And uh, the protocol that does that is the template provider. 
It uh, uh, plugs into Bitcoin Core and sends up templates to its client, the client being the pool or the miner, depending on who's doing the transaction selection. Um, for example, if the miner is doing transaction selection, the miner will be needing to run uh, a Bitcoin Core node and the template provider logic, and then it will pass uh, its shares uh, up to the pool. Um, actually, sorry, before it passes the shares, it'll communicate with the pool the transactions it selected. And there's uh, a negotiation that happens between the miner and the pool. So the pool can say, hey, yeah, these transactions are good. Continue mining on them. And so what that, uh, that sub-protocol is the job negotiator logic. Um, what's interesting about the template provider is that you actually don't necessarily have to be running it locally. Um, there could be like a third party service, like a template provider as a service, for example, that could be running a Bitcoin node and sending down templates to its clients. That client could be uh, a miner or a pool, and it could be a completely different organization. So I think that's a unique piece of the protocol. Yeah, if pools are worried about uh, uh, the, the potential regulatory overhead of selecting transactions, then miners should be too. And, and being able to, to export that to anyone running a Bitcoin core node uh, hopefully is hopefully alleviates that somewhat. By the way, I'm, you know, a lot of people talk about um, transaction censorship here and, and worry that the pools might uh, come in and, and censor transactions. I like to make the point that this is actually a really bad idea from a law enforcement perspective. If you want to actually find criminals, um, it's necessary that criminals be able to send their funds to a custodian where you can actually seize the funds. If you just prevent transactions, um, you're not helping yourself. Uh, so I, I think if a regulator stepped in and started censoring transactions, they, I mean, they're just shooting themselves in the foot. Um, and I, I think it's unlikely to happen, and we should lobby against it if it does happen, on the grounds that you actually want uh, criminals to send their funds to places where it can be seized. And it would be ideal if we make it practically impossible using Stratum V2 and uh, having users all, all the miners select their own transactions. <laughs> yeah, well, definitely. <laughs> we're both working on products that go that direction, so um, hopefully we're not going to have to worry about it. Uh, and you have a talk coming up a little later, Bob. Do you want to give a little teaser on yeah. some of the stuff you're working on and, and what you're going to talk about? Yeah, so looking to the future, right, um, there's, there's been a lot of talk about kind of rebooting P2 pool, right? Uh, and up to now, you know, I back back in 2015, I did a little bit of work uh, looking at how do you how do you make a blockchain faster, um, and that that results in a directed asynchronous graph. So uh, at three o'clock in the uh, BitDevs Village, I'm going to be talking about Braid Pool, which is an attempt to reboot P2 Pool uh, using a directed asynchronous graph. Um, and the the key technology that really makes it possible now, or it hasn't been possible before, is the ability to make a very large multisig. Uh, we now have uh, MuSig2, we have fr the Frost and Roast protocols, which allow me to make very large uh, um, multi-sigs, which is basically replacing the pool, right? So you have to organize the payout, the consensus rules uh, pay everybody, and you have to um, have a lot of people agree to that. And that is that is essentially the blockchain that is the, the, the P2 pool or decentralized mining pool. But there's another idea um, I wanted to bring up that uh, really start from Chris Belcher. Um, who posted on the Bitcoin Dev mailing list a few years ago? Uh, this is what I call the hub model, um, and what he what he proposed to do. I mean, so there's kind of two branches here. We could go in the future. One is uh, the hub model, and the other is uh, the proposal. I'll give it three o'clock. But um, what the hub model is is basically send all your outputs to um, basically a single output that is semi-centralized, uh, but you can make it sort of trustless, and then have lightning channels between that hub and all the hashers. Um, so this, this proposal had several iterations. My collaborator, Kulpreet Singh, uh, posted an iteration of this on Bitcoin Dev um, a few months ago as well. Um, I, it, it is semi-centralized, and I th I'm afraid that that particular direction, I, I really, really, really want to combine mining and lightning somehow. Um, but I'm afraid that that particular, uh, the centralization involved in the hub um, will kill it. Uh, and I think nobody will end up using it. Um, there has been proposals to turn that into some kind of federation, which and using the same technology, using Frost and Roast, we can make a very large multi-sig federation uh, that would control the mining uh, payouts. Um, so there's a couple different ideas there. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's that's the history of mining in a nutshell. Yeah. What else? Did we miss anything? I don't think what so. What else happened? Well, we didn't talk about ASIC boost at all. That's true. ASIC boost didn't come up. There was some speculation that, in fact, the, the Coinbase transaction limit in the S7 was because of ASIC boost. But 
everything about uh, Bitmain's ASIC boost usage in the S7 and S9s was basically speculation because they wouldn't admit to any of it because they thought they were doing something very, very wrong and they, I mean, it was patent infringement, but now the patent's open and uh, everyone does ASIC boost mm -hmm. and you can do it without actually looking at the transactions if you're willing to be open about it. Um, so, yeah, I don't think ASIC boost came up, but I think that's basically everything that ever happened in mining, right? Everything. Um, so with that, I mean, I guess we'll open the floor to questions. Uh, feel free to ask anything about what we talked about or, or certainly anything about, about mining more broadly. Um, if we can't answer it, there's some actual miners sitting in the back uh, or around who can probably answer your question uh, in some other way. So with Stratum V2, you guys are working on solutions, uh, I mean, so that miners can make their own locks. Um, are there any censorship concerns in block broadcast? So do they have to broadcast through the pool or can they broadcast directly to the network? Mm, that's a good question. Yeah, so I mean, they can, I don't know the current state of it. I know originally there was a, a thinking that basically both could broadcast. Um, uh, certainly the user can broadcast because they have all of the information on what they're mining. Um, so if you if you have all of that information, you can always broad broadcast the block. Um, and that's part of the reason why, you know, having these relay networks, fast relay networks going forward is going to be important because the users or the, the end miner is broadcasting the block. And again, a lot of mining farms aren't in large data centers in urban areas. They're kind of out in the, out in the sticks somewhere where you might not have a super great internet connection. You're not going to have gigabit fiber or something. So related uh, question about the whole idea. So the, the purpose of miners mining the block, as I see it, is to solve a certain kind of problem where the pools, since there's only a few pools and they're very important, uh, you don't want people going to the pools and saying you can't put this transaction in or whatever, the, the, like a, a list of approved transactions in a pool. So the whole idea is to stop them since they're small in number, they should get the transactions from the mempool from somewhere else. But I was thinking instead of kicking it back to whoever's doing the hashing, why not just specialize more and have three groups of people? You could have people who just do SHA-256 hashing as much as they can, and you can have pools who do the the risk mitigate, the statistical risk uh, pooling. And then you could just say the pool gets the list of transactions like from any full node on the network, and they can just say, well, we just, it's our policy to just pick whatever, uh, whatever's paying the most, whoever's mempool would give us the most, and we just look at all the mempools or whatever, something like that. And they say, well, there's this third group and so that's not the pools. That's also a huge number of people, which could just be every full node. You could just say, like, we, the pools, just look at all the, the world of, of nodes or what everyone, what everyone, the world of mempools, and we just pick. It's our policy to pick the profit maximizing, the revenue maximizing uh, thing from this third group. And that is my thought. Instead of saying go back to miners, why not just go forward to a completely third group? I think that's like the beauty of the template provider, right? Because like any party can run the template provider, the pool, the miner, or a third party. Um, and the template provider just interfa interfaces with the Bitcoin core node and the, the mempool there. Yeah, so I think the only difference from your model, the only thing different from your model to Stratum V2 is basically that the, the hasher is the one who picks which template provider to use rather than the pool picking which template provider to use. Because um, the, the, Separating it out is kind of what Ethereum did with their proof of stake transition, and turns out everyone has just picked the same template provider, and those template providers are in fact OFAC compliant, and so like forty percent of their blocks are censored or something like that. It's it the number keeps going up, which is maybe not what we wanted. Yeah, some people are saying it's it's over fifty now. So, hi, I have a question about. Um unfold blocks. So I see why a miner would get a block reward on a zero block, and I see why it would be a full block, but I don't see why there would be an unfold block even though the mempool is full. Um, like there must be some inefficiency in there. What's exactly the inefficiency? And I've heard that Stratum V2 might help with that. So, go ahead. Talking about empty blocks, right? Yeah, so 
no. Oh, sorry. I understand why there would be empty blocks, and I understand why there would be full blocks. I don't understand why there would be. You have to keep in mind that, like the uh, generally, um, the transactions that end up in a block were pulled from a mempool, you know, thirty seconds or a minute ago. Uh, so you're never all, you're never going to fully clear the mempool because uh, generally it's you know as of a few minutes ago, and those transactions that came in in the last minute are not going to get mined until the next block. Um, but I'm not aware of cases where uh, there were materially more transactions and the block wasn't full. Um, okay, yeah, then, then I don't, I'm not, for sure, not sure. Yeah, this is slightly, uh, maybe a little off topic, but the, where do you see the future of mining going? Are we like near the point where we're at, you know, sort of the, the smallest feature size CPUs are becoming commodity sort of things that people can buy without worrying about them being obsoleted in a year or two. Is that, are we kind of getting to this? Is that gonna, how's that gonna change the future of, of mining, pool mining also? Well, I, I think we are. I mean, we've kind of plateaued, right? Uh, it took some time for mining to catch up to the lot, smallest feature size uh, ASIC production, right? Um, but, you know, the, the speed of uh, chips hasn't increased in a decade. We're still sitting at four gigahertz, right? And that's, that's a limitation due to silicon itself. Um, and we're also getting close to the quantum limits uh, of chip sizes too. We can't push much further. So it's, we're starting to see a plateau in Moore's law, right? Um, and yeah, what that does mean in the long term is that uh, these things are commodities. They'll last a long time. Um, there's not really any good reason that silicon fails. I mean, you have a, a electron hole migration, which happens because they, these things run pretty hot. Um, I've had a thesis for a long time that uh, hasn't been realized yet that Bitcoin mining may actually go to old, go back to old nodes to, to larger feature sizes because these things generate a lot of heat and what you want and it's an embarrassingly parallel computation so you don't really want to do the same computation serially really fast but you want to do a lot of them in parallel and you want to dissipate heat really effectively and so having larger feature sizes might actually be beneficial uh, you know at this point about 70 percent of the energy uh, wasted in uh, ASIC mining is lost to gate leakage current. It's about 70% of the energy in miners is lost to a physical process that has nothing to do with the computation. Uh, and, that's, and that gets worse as the feature size gets smaller. So we're sitting right now at about 70% of that energy gets wasted. Um, and I, I think we're going to find as, you know, microprocessors get smaller for your phone, uh, Bitcoin miners are going to go the other direction. But what has happened is that as uh, TSMC and Samsung and the guys who have the, the fabs move to smaller feature sizes, they're actually upgrading their old fabs. And so the, you know, the 12 nanometer, 15 nanometer fabs aren't around anymore. <laughs> they don't exist. Um, so you don't really have the option to go back and make larger feature size. But you know, as this industry grows, I think at some point it's gonna become beneficial to uh, you know, make fabs specifically for Bitcoin equipment, just as it's gonna be beneficial to make you know, renewable energy farms specifically for Bitcoin equipment. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not a, a chip expert, but I mean, yeah, I, I think the, 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 the real question in my mind has always been like, does the, does the industry get big enough that we're, we're really pushing the fabs, you know, uh, there's also, you know, Bitcoin mining because it is so parallel and it, it is so hot, you can't really actually dissipate. If you, if you filled a, uh, of chip, if you filled a normal size chip coming off a wafer with Bitcoin mining, uh, you would you wouldn't be able to dissipate the heat. So like the chips are kind of small, but like you could also, for example, use Bitcoin mining to test the next new fab process because it is so parallel. If your yields aren't very good, you don't really care. You just laser cut out the the sections of the chip that didn't work right. Um, and I mean they do this, right? They do that. Intel does this. AMD does this. Whatever they actually do, cut out uh, little. You know, if there's an eight core processor and one core doesn't work, they might you know, cut one out and sell it as a five core pro or a seven core processor or something. Um, but you can make this much more aggressive with Bitcoin mining. So you could, for example, be testing your new process on Bitcoin mining. Sadly, Bitcoin mining just isn't a big enough industry as a portion of global chip sales to, for them to care that much. Um, we'll see how it continues to develop. I don't know. Yeah. Hey, could you talk a little bit about selfish mining and the current state of uh, is it profitable to do selfish mining? Is it possible to detect it? And then also, is there anything the pool can do to prove that they're not doing selfish mining? 
Um, so the, the paper this is referring to, selfish mining uh, from, I don't know, five years ago or so, basically the, the idea is instead of mining one block, I'm going to try to mine two blocks in fast succession. And the threshold for doing this is about 33%. Uh, so if I have 33% of the hash rate, um, this becomes a more profitable strategy to mine than, uh, than just mining one block at a time. Um, so that paper's out there by Ite Iyal and uh, Gunsairer. Um, and as far as I know, the result is correct. Um, it is detectable, right? Because uh, you, know, you suddenly see two blocks appear when you would have seen one. Um, but that also means that the 51% attack that Satoshi originally talked about um, is not 51%, it's 34%. It, um, it's a little more subtle, right? So selfish mining allows you to get an ab a, a, a amount of blocks in excess of your hash rate, and you're, you're going to get more blocks than your proportion of the hash rate, but it doesn't allow you to prevent anyone else from getting a block until 51%. So the kind of the the censorship, the outright censorship attack is is a little different because you still have to let other people get blocks sometimes in order to, to optimize your, your profit. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's like the 33% the threshold is like, well, it depends on how quickly you can relay blocks in comparison to your peers at 33%. I think, I think that was like when you always lose the race or when you get the ra win the race half the time or something but if you have much better block propagation you could potentially do it at lower thresholds but but to bob's point it, it is easy to detect because orphan rates go up um and so you know if if you have uh somebody selfish mining sure you get more blocks than than you should be getting but everyone's orphan rate goes up so it it is not profitable for the first difficulty adjustment. Uh, you have to wait till the next difficulty adjustment in order for it to be profitable. Um, but you you would be able to see it from that. Um, it's also weirdly not profitable if you're paying out paper share, uh, right? So so miners or pool 